Uh, good evening, folks. My name is Jim Lutis. I'm uh, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives and Executive Director of the Pell Center. And uh, let me echo Teresa and say Happy New Year. Welcome back uh, to Selve. Welcome back to the Pell Center. Uh, this is the kickoff of our Spring 2024 lecture series. If you didn't get a program, I would encourage you to do so because on the back you'll see that we have a tremendous lineup of events planned uh, this semester. After tonight's lecture, which I'm sincerely looking forward to, next week we're welcoming Reverend Nantombi Naomi Tutu, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu's daughter, uh, to help us celebrate MLK Week here at the university. Uh, we've got Joshua Bennett, who uh, in one night in 2000, uh, let me do my math here, in 2010, uh, he participated in a spoken word night at the White House. Um, you might know about that spoken word night at the White House because that's the night that Lin-Manuel Miranda exploded on the scene with Hamilton. Uh, the other guy who set the White House uh, buzzing that night is Joshua Bennett. He's gonna be here, uh, that's on February 27th. There's a great lineup of programming. I hope that you'll take advantage of it. Uh, but to get tonight's program started, it's my real pleasure to welcome to the stage a member of the university's board of trustees, Catherine Aldrich. Good evening. It's uh, great to be back in Newport, particularly to be back at Salve, and a really great honor for me tonight to be able to introduce my friend and former colleague, Lieutenant General Glavy, who's currently the Deputy Commandant for Information for the Marine Corps. Um, General Glavy is familiar with Newport. He started his career at the Naval Academy Prep School and uh, is a frequent visitor to Newport now because his son, who's here in the audience tonight, is an instructor at the Circus Warfare School. Uh, General Glavy and I first met about 20 years ago in Okinawa, and uh, while we are great friends, unfortunately for the last uh, like seven years, we probably saw more of each other in the hallways of the Pentagon as I was the Deputy Counsel to the Commandant, he was Commander Marfor Cyber, and then Deputy Commandant um, for Information. As I was talking with um, Jim about possible topics and, and ideas for some of the things for the, for the lectures in the spring, I couldn't think of a more informed senior leader to talk to us about information and how it applies to the international security environment than Lieutenant General Glavy. So um, it's with great pleasure that I welcome you here tonight. Um, I am, you know, I'm really impressed that after the event on Sunday night with the Buffalo Bills Stop. that you're able to Stop. be here with us tonight. <laughs> but um, thank you very much and we're all looking forward to this talk. Thank you, Catherine. Too kind. Madam President, thanks for this incredible honor. Dr. Lutas, sir, thank you for this invite. And Catherine, uh, great intro, as always. I would like to start this off by sharing a little uh, sentiment with you, because almost 43 years ago, August of 1981, the journey that finds me here with you tonight started here. And Newport, Rhode Island, as a 17-year-old midshipman candidate at the Naval Academy Prep School. It's been an amazing journey and have had amazing uh, opportunities, incredible family, beautiful wife that's great friends with Catherine, three kids that all wear the cloth of this nation. I've had amazing Marines, eye-watering Marines that have carried me on their back. I've had leaders that I would low crawl over broken glass for. Like, I've had everything possible to get me here. But the most important thing, the most important thing through that entire journey that mattered most, of course, you know, here I am, Hail Holy Queen, but that one thing that mattered most was my faith. Right? My faith got me through those good times and bads, right? Whether it was flying the most lethal weapon in our nation's arsenal, a Marine Lance Corporal, to the most heinous places in the world, or flying the President of the United States to some of the most amazing places in the world, or executing operations of strategic impact at US Cyber Command. There was always a prayer I said prior to that, and I share it with you, and it went something like this. Dear Lord, don't let me screw this up. <laughs> so I start tonight with a similar prayer to kick this off. And again, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your interest in being a part of this community so, so special in, uh, in, in what we're doing here. I think I got this mic on. Too high? Yeah. Too high? Yeah. All right. All right. 
Hopefully I don't screw it up. Okay, change. Of all the things, qualities that senior leaders need today in the Department of Defense, this is it, right? This ability to adapt to the environment that surrounds us and truly change. And not, you know, cosmetically, I'm talking foundation, foundational change. We find ourselves in a period of immense change. You obviously follow what's going on in world events today, what's going on in technology, right? And it is upon us, a swirl that you can't possibly imagine. And people who my age tend not to be able to do this very well, uh, full disclosure. Uh, you know, there's an author who once said, if you do something 10,000 times, you'll be great at it. And we tend to go there, right? We tend to want to be very good at what we do, to do it over and over and over again. There's something to be said about that in the world of aviation, right? Our greatest risk mitigation is truly that, right? No change, right? Change is the mother of all risk, as we say. But today, in this environment, in the national security environment that we find ourselves, it's all about change. And I will tell you, foundationally, it's all about humility, right? I have spent, uh, you know, outside of this, this incredibly comforting aviation part of my career, I've lived in this cyber domain. And let me tell you something, it's uncomfortable. It's really, really uncomfortable for me, right, to walk into most meetings, most conference rooms, and to be the dumbest guy in the room. But it's also invigorating, because it means there's a generation of empowered, you know, for the most part, very young, very uh, energetic, very imaginative people, Marines, civilians across the joint force that have really powered us forward. And the success we've had, I will tell you, we owe it to them. Change of all the things. And the Marine Corps is going through incredible transformation right now. And it's not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. And everybody wants to criticize. Why? Because it's the good old days, right? We always remember that and want to go back to that. And everything besides honor, courage, and commitment is on the table. Everything is on the table. So we've been here before. For the United States Marine Corps in 1950, as the communist North Koreans roll south of the 38th parallel, they roll up everything in their path, right? And all that's left is down in a small city called Pusan, and it's referred to as the Pusan perimeter. That's it. That's the only bastion of freedom left on the Korean peninsula. Enter United States Marines, what was called the Marine Provisional Brigade, and that's just code for we didn't have enough people in a single unit that we had to get a hodgepodge of Marines from all over the place to go deploy to fend off this threat. Incredible. These, these Marines, these are good Marines. These are World War II veterans. And T.R. Fehrenbach, a soldier no less, talks about these Marines with, with, with incredible heartfelt feeling. And, and it could be any member of the Joint Force. This, this just happens to be the Marines and the Marine Corps. And they show up, and they had that honor, courage, commitment, the precision, the discipline, everything you would expect of your Marines. Of course, that's how they were trained. But, but, right, they show up with an advantage, a significant advantage. Of course, on the far left there, the helicopter, brand new. It's not even out of the box yet, and we're deploying it to Korea because we need it. We need a capability to get this advantage. And the helicopter really turns in this incredible reconnaissance platform. Of course, you know, being able to see up at 3,000 feet and 5,000 feet is different than at six feet. So the helicopter gave a, a great capability to truly understand what the adversary was doing in front of them. Because of the helicopter, they're actually referred to as the fire brigade because they could tell where the enemy was and then respond to that threat. Of course, F, uh, uh, escort carrier full of F4U Corsairs. And, and the F4U was a staple of World War II, nothing special about that. But at the time, the Marine Corps is experimenting with what's called close air support and combined arms. And, and this airplane now becomes truly one of our, our greatest assets and how it's used with maneuver with our infantry forces. Again, something that we learned and innovated during the interwar years. And then finally, the 3.5-inch super bazooka. Why is this important? Because the Soviet-built T-34 tanks were literally coming south un unstoppable. The, the prior bazooka, 2.37-inch, right, couldn't do anything. The rounds were bouncing off them. This, this super bazooka, the round goes through it. 
And like that really matters. So certainly the Marines show up with all the accolades that you'd expect of Marines, but at the end of the day, they show up with advantages. Advantages that mattered, right? Advantages that, that provided success in the battlefield that you would expect that we would source our young men and women. What's our advantage today? What is our advantage today? Something we gotta always be thinking about because everything that we certainly hold near and dear from, from a, a military standpoint, the honor, courage, and commitment is always what we gotta bring to bear. But, right, we gotta, we gotta make sure when they go forward, they have what they need to be successful. I will tell you, the advantage that we have today is data. It's data, right? This is where we gotta go if, if we are gonna be successful in the future battlefields. And it's not insignificant that there's a lot of other people doing similar. Data is important. The capability that, that makes data asymmetric is space, space. Uh, as an aviator, the first thing that goes into combat, into a crisis or contingency is aviation. Why? The United States Air Force flows first, right? They set up the Joint Force Air Component Commander to command and control air, the air domain. Without air, we're, we're not gonna maneuver on the ground or on the water. So aviation always was that first move for the US military. Now, going forward, space, right? The ultimate high ground. Infinitesimal, where, where does it end? 2.99 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, of course, is our limb fact. Space is truly the asymmetric advantage that we gotta combine with data in, in order to make sure when we show up in the battle space, we're ready. Of course, near and dear to our heart is John Glenn's uh, third lap uh, in Friendship 7. He takes this picture of, uh, of, of the sunrise. And he happens to be located over the South China Sea of all places, not that that really matters. And when we stood up U.S. Marine Corps Forces Space Command, uh, we used that visual as best we could uh, in, in the emblem there, a little trivia if you ever want to stump somebody on a Friday night. Uh, space, no space, no chance, right? A lot of competition in space, it matters for a lot of good reasons, right? For a lot of good reasons, it matters. Of course, the technology matters, right? Microprocessors, Moore's Law, all that stuff plays into it, and we gotta keep track of it. Understanding where those advantages are are really important, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, but, but this matters, and, and, and things go from being buzzwords like cloud or AI and ML to be in reality and actually delivering outcomes. And you can see here, you know, right around the development of the cloud, we see this asymmetric advantage on what we can do and compute and store. And it is asymmetric, right? It, it's a hockey stick. It's going in a direction greater than one to one. So this becomes now back to the advantage model. How do we put all of this together? So if we were doing your MBA here, right, this would be the chart that you would study, and how do businesses succeed, right? If you live down here in this latency model, right, you're doomed for, what do we say, reset, right? Bankruptcy, whatever those words are. And if you're the US military, you're, you're, in, you're in defeat, right? This, this space means defeat. There is obviously risk on both sides of this slope. Right? This is doing something 10,000 times and being really good at it. That's a certain comfort level that we so desire. Right? Doing the same old, same old. Something to be said about that. This idea of change, the unknown, also has risk. Right? We've got to fully embrace and understand it and think through it in the best of our mind. But we've got to go there. We've got to go there. We've got to live above that slope. We've been taught this lesson before. You know, how to fight in the information environment, you know, has been unfortunately, as in, 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 the dark side of the force has, has taught us this. I was at US Cyber Command when ISIS did their thing. And uh, they, they were masters of the information environment. You know, out of the northern Iraqi desert, right, driving up gun Toyota Hilux pickup trucks with Android 6 phones, hotspots, VSAT, pretty decent graphics capabilities, they proceeded to take over two countries. We can have a discussion about how many people they killed, but at the end of the day, they scared the shit out of everybody, excuse me, 
right? They really did. This, this picture right here literally brought Baghdad to its knees, right? The, this was not the Zarqawi butcher of, of the early Iraqi freedom, right? The, the heinous, right? This, this was theater. They were really good at this. It, certainly, it's the dark side of the force and uh, something we don't like to spend time thinking about it. But if we do not understand, right, we are doomed to repeat. And so understanding how this happened and why, how does an organ, uh, uh, you know, something as, as, as terrible as this go from tens and twenties of followers to hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of followers? That's what happened. They took over two countries. I was at U.S. Cyber Command, and until, until October of 2015, when the streets of Paris turned into a video game, 130 people are dead. Not much was done about it. Action was taken. Uh, believe it or not, uh, Admiral Gilday is my boss at the time, CNO Gilday. Oh, help me here. And we create what's called Joint Task Force Ares. Right? This was our response to the heinousness of Paris because we had to disrupt their ability to maneuver in the cyber domain. They had freedom of maneuver. They did, and certainly there's a lot of laws in the United States that protect what they were trying to do, right? but at the end of the day, we had to respond. So we create Joint Task Force Ares. It's really the best of the best, everything we could bring to bear from a U.S. Cybercom standpoint on how we are going to disrupt them in the cyber domain, how we're going to get back at them and counter what they were doing. You know, not, not for the faint of heart, certainly, and working through all the legalities, thanks to great people like Catherine, right, we, we actually had success. And I use the word disrupt to describe what we did because we certainly didn't defeat. And, you know, there, there, there was a, there is a complicated... But, but we were able to take their, their, their ability to master this domain and the information environment and truly limit it, disrupt it. Uh, so I go away for two years, sabbatical down at 2nd Marine Aircraft Wing and become a pilot again. And then I show back up to U.S. Cyber Command. And uh, General Nakasone, who's the boss there, the, the commander there now, he says, you got it. So... The Marine Corps takes command of Joint Task Force Ares, and now this becomes ours. And the first thing that he did in the first mission he gave me is he said, hey, we're going to take everything that we did with JTF Ares, and we're going to tell the world. Like, this is TSSCI, crazy, nutty classifications, right? In fact, I'm even talking about with y'all is still kind of makes the skin and hair on the back of my neck. But we declassified the whole damn thing, right? The whole thing. What we did, how we did it, why we did it. Why, right? Why? Well, we're going to make sure the world knows. You know, you know we, we had a problem in how we were going to engage in the Internet, right? Engage in cyber from a military standpoint. There was a real reluctance to militarize the Internet, real reluctance. And we wanted to be very careful on how we do this. So we had to get our foot in the door and explain ourselves in the information environment on what we were doing. And so this was a well-thought-out action that we were taking. You could almost say it was a military action to explain to the world, right? We're, we're coming out, right? We're, we're doing the do. And, uh, yeah, so NPR, we sit down with NPR for about a week. We do a podcast. Oh, my gosh. I mean, you talk about, yeah, sweating it out, never quite sure how close we were to going to jail or not. But, 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 but this was a, a, a resounding success. And today, JTF Ares still has mission sets in great power competition based on their success in counterterrorism. Of course, you know, the rest of the world's pretty good at this stuff, right? Russia, Russia's built on outright lies. Their ability to command and control the information environment is probably the root of, of who they are and what they have done, certainly from, from the USSR days, but all the way to today, right? built on outright lies. They live this every day. And they're very good at it. Uh -oh. And they're very good at it. And they're very good at it. So everybody remembers what, what, what happened down in Crimea, right? Very successful. Crimea, 
we talk about little green men, and of course we always do that when we don't accept something as, as being equivalent, right? Somehow we're going to downgrade it. But, but how they executed the Korea takeover was a well thought out, well executed military operation, bar none, primarily focused in the information environment, right? So, right, probably one of the key indicators they needed to know is how was the US government going to react, right? So if just go through, well, well, if I was figuring this out, I wonder what State Department's going to think, hmm, right? Boy, I, I wonder what the Pentagon's going to think. Two weeks out of net, without a network, two weeks. And boy, probably go right to the source and find out what's going on in the White House. But, but this is good tradecraft. We, certainly the dark side of the force, and I apologize to be using these examples, but this is good work, right? From, you know, looking at it certainly uh, and, and I will tell you, you know, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. So as, as Ukraine is beginning to kick off, you know, we, you know we're, we're a learning, we're coachable. We're a learning organization. We can't be so naive to be caught flat-footed in these, these information environment transactions that are to our disfavor. So I mentioned earlier, this idea of declassifying very highly classified information is not in our repertoire of things that we're good at, right? This isn't something we do every day. We do it rarely, rarely. That, the first time I've been around it was when we did the JTF Berries. General Nakasone's my boss and continues this, this type of, 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 of capability development. But of course, as those forces are, are uh, as the situation is developing along the border, we take very highly classified information and unclassified, right? For the world to know what is going on. Disrupt, degrade, certainly didn't defeat, but, but we changed the course of how this was going to go by that, that execution in the information environment, by letting the world know. Simple information brought to bear in the right way, right? In this case, with some risk from a classification level, but the risk was obviously worth the gain really important to understand how this works and one, how, how one operates in the information environment. Of course, uh, People's Republic of China also very good at this, right? Chinese, uh, excuse me, communist governments tend to be very controlling and, you know, this is how they do it, right? So really good. And, and if, you know, if they say China has missed uh, the three prior industrial revolutions, right, they're not missing the fourth. They're not missing the fourth industrial revolution, right? And not only are they good at it, but they got 1.3 billion requirements that they're good at, understanding the digitized environment that they operate to understand and command and control the people they lead, right? This is, this is real. And, and again, we cannot underestimate our adversary. We always do it at our own peril. We can't do that here. Taiwan. Taiwan. Uh, there's two sides to this discussion, of course, right? As we talk about Wilsonian democracy, right? We need a free liberal democracy in Asia, always to the best interest of this nation, without a shadow of a doubt. Real politics side says, oh my gosh, 63% of semiconductors microprocessors are made in Taiwan? 90% of the high-end ones that we find in the gadgets and gizmos in our hands today? Like, Taiwan is important. It's really important. And denying that, right, doesn't, doesn't serve us well. So the facts and the data speak, this is important. And we'll see how we react, but no doubt important. It's so important, I think if you've been following the news, you've seen some of these activities, right? The Dutch have actually provide the greatest, most state-of-the-art capability in the ability to do the etching of these chips, this lithography. In this case, extreme ultraviolet lithography is the next step of Moore's law. And a single company, a single company has the technology, one company. And it's a 15 times improvement. Is this important? Is this important? Hugely important, right? That, a lot going on here in the news, if you read really below the bylines, is, is this battle back and forth. ASML is the company, it's a Dutch company, bought an American company, you know how the global economics work, and next thing you know, they've, they've cornered the market on, on, on this really significant 
game-changing capability. This, this is the difference between hitting your target and not hitting your target, having an advantage and not having an advantage. And if you think about they're producing fits on a hair follicle, and it takes three 747s to transport it, right? It's ginormous, the capability to do this. This is the technology we find ourselves in. Over 20 years of already research and development that goes in to build these capabilities, not for the faint of heart, right? Really important from a national defense standpoint to truly understand how these advantages are gained and lost. Okay, so entering the United States Marine Corps, my job, right, I gotta somehow take the Marine Corps and fully immerse ourselves in how we're going to do this. Uh, 38th Commandant General Berger, very thoughtful, cognitive uh, Marine. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write about it, right? We're gonna sit down and we're gonna write about it. We're gonna take a step back, we're gonna get out of all the lexicon and buzzwords, and we're gonna have a discussion. And the discussion is MCDP-8. So I spent my first 10, 11 months on the job, me and him and some great Marines that did all the work, writing this document. And the Commandant had a very active pen. It's how he is, he writes most of his stuff. But we went through this in painstaking detail. So he said, hey, Sergeant Berger's gotta understand it just like General Berger's gotta understand it. And so we, we kind of focus on a few areas. Information is God. I mean, you know, start writing an essay now on what information is. And, you know, we'll come back next week before you can finish it. But, but basically, we got down into four functions. And, and they're obvious, but, but, but they give us, they scope us on what we want to do when we talk about information, especially from a Marine Corps and military standpoint. You got you to start somewhere, and, and, and you got to get yourself, uh, you know, in, 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 in the right scope. So generate, preserve, project, deny, right? I, they kind of speak for themselves. And they're, they're at, if you think about it, really obvious is as we move Marines all over the world, they're doing this stuff every day. In the past, we tend not to pay attention to it, right? Now, back to that data slide I showed you earlier, that's going to be the coin of the round. Understanding adversary activity based on AI, artificial intelligence, is all data driven. And where that data comes from and how you use it, like really important. It, it becomes in and of itself a mission set. So, so important. That's how the, the machine learning is done. And why, right? The outcomes matter. Outcomes always matter. So three things that we focused on, again, which can be an intellectual discussion on what, what's right, what's wrong, but systems overmatch. We've got to win the ones and zeros fight. We, our, our gears got to be better than their gear, period. Got to, back to that extreme ultraviolet lithography, right? We, we want the 15X on our side but we want to win the systems overmatch. Two, we got to win the prevailing narrative. Of course we do. We got to be in the, on the moral high ground. It's who we are. It's what we do. And finally, we got to have this idea of, of resiliency. In this domain, in this environment, it's brutal, right? It's, it's brutal. The misinformation, the disinformation, you got to be able to take a punch. Just want to demonstrate what that looks like. So, this is just using Ukraine as an example, and, and these aren't scaled, so please don't uh, grade my work here too hard. But, but this is an example of what we're talking about from systems overmatch. If one were to take, I'll call it the order of battle, but all the airplanes, all the tanks, all the artillery pieces that Russia has, and stacked it up against all the tanks, all the right, Ukraine has, it's incredibly inferior, right? This to this. Now you start laying some other things on top of that, right, and we get into this overmatch that I'm, I'm trying to articulate. And specifically, that really pushes them up and over the top to whatever advantage they may or may not have for periods of time that they do or do not have, right, turns into this ability to command and control, right? Goes back to space. Goes back to this resilient space layer. Thir th you know, over 35,000 persistent low Earth orbit satellites floating around the belt, right? Can't shoot them all. Can't kill them all. And it's proven it's it's proven itself that, that Ukraine has been able to survive through this, and I think most people saw this play out literally on, uh, on Twitter, right? But, but very real. And though you would think the advantage goes here, right? There's a technology advantage that creates the overmatch required in order to have a very inferior military country, right, have a fighting chance. We'll see how it all goes. Of course, prevailing narrative is something that you know, President Zelensky has been very good at, 
right? I mean, you know, if you've seen this, really amazing what, what he has done. You know, he's on, he's on good ground. That ground's always, you know, it's, it's always contested too, right? You look at world opinion, it, it matters. This is a persistent thing he's got to do day in and day out in order to, to gain that prevailing narrative. It doesn't happen by chance, right? You've got to go do it. You've got to think through it. And he's better than average at doing that, and it matters. And then ultimately, resiliency, right? You've got to take a punch. You've got to live in the disinformation, mis misinformation world. It's, it's around us everywhere. And, and you've got to have that body hardening concept in order to live through it. Okay, I'm not going to spend, this is my life right here. This is what I do every day, right? So, so this idea, I, I mentioned the Korea piece, right, and what the Marine Corps does and what they're damn good at, not sorry, is this idea of, of combined arms. And it goes something like this, the full integration of fires and effects, that to mitigate one, you become more vulnerable to another. And so this idea of bringing information, what we've described in how we execute day in the life you know, military operations from a Marine Corps perspective is the art and science of truly putting it all together in the task that we have at hand. And we have episodic success, but we are not even close to doing what needs to be done in some of the prior examples to combine it all together as a joint force. This, this is it. This is, again, the Marine Corps journey and ultimately what we got to do. And it, and it all has this data centricity to it. Whether, whether I'm doing a, a NEO operation or I'm doing humanitarian assistance disaster relief in Haiti, right? you can imagine the amount of information required to do those things. And ultimately, we got to make good decisions. There, there's no time on the clock to make dumb choices. We've done that enough. right? we got to bring this to bear so we make the best choice, the best decision possible. We could spend all semester on this, and maybe we can have a class on it, huh? Uh, so the Marine Corps is doing what's called force design. I uh, had an opportunity, I'm just sharing this with you, uh, with uh, General Phil Shuttler to write this article. General Shuttler is a 95-year-old Marine who fought in Korea. Amazing Marine. is an F-4 pilot. Uh, he was the father of really some innovative, disruptive things uh, in the Marine Corps. The A-6B is an electronic warfare jet. And we have a long-range radar. Anyway, just he was that guy, right? He was General Berger before General Berger and really brought to bear a lot of disruptive capabilities. He calls me up one day. I had known him and had him as a guest speaker down in Second Mall. He says, hey, I'm trying to get this article published, right? I'm not having any luck. I said, hey, hey, General, why don't you come in for lunch? We'll go down to the Second Nav mess, and, and let's have at it, right? So he comes in about 1130. We head out of there. They throw us out at 1400, you know, three hours later. He is just teaching me like you've never been taught before. He's got all his books with him. He's got all his research with him. And we go through this whole article, and he begins to explain how important, in this case, World War II was to the Marine Corps. And based on our success in the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, and the Gilbert Islands, Tarawa, and the Marianas, Peleliu, and all the way to the Philippines, Ok uh, Iwo Jima and Okinawa, right, our fathers grandfathers, great-grandfathers, gave us incredible advantage. They gave us good ground, right? The terrain that we have today in Asia, thanks to them, right? Not for the faint of heart how that happened. But it was an incredible uh, art and science to military operations and how they did it. And this article goes into explaining uh, how history can be a great teacher to, to what we're doing. And I leave you with my last slide here. This is Colonel John Boyd bombastic, cantankerous, a real wild man, uh, and, and, and Boyd uh, really bucked the system. He was that guy. He was the ultimate disruptor, Air Force pilot, one each. His greatest following, U.S. Marines, when he died in his funeral, the chapel at, at Fort Myers filled with Marines. But Boyd had this trinity. He called it people, ideas, and things in that order. So everything I've talked to you about tonight, about technology and how important it all is, the only thing that really matters most is, is what happens right here. Because this is going to provide this that's going to maximize this. And that's where we find ourselves, is how do we create this asymmetric advantage, 
right, in a very disruptive world we find ourselves in that is moving fast, fast in a technology way, how, how do we create that deterrent offense effect, right? Ultimately is, is why there is a U.S. military, why there is a Department of Defense. And if we don't have a focus on what the power of information is and at its essential basics, the power of data, we're going to find ourselves in a disadvantage. So I leave that with you for any questions here. Last 20 minutes, almost right, uh, right on in the time hack. But uh, whatever questions you may have, I am wide open to, to take them. So those of you who've been here before know the drill. But if you haven't, raise your hand. The microphone will come to you. Uh, and we'll get as many questions as time allows here uh, for General Glavy. If while, while you're pondering, I might just throw the first question out here. Uh, so when you look at um, America's adversaries in this space, uh, are they following a similar path in their pursuit of information dominance? If we think about China or if we think about Russia, maybe let's pick one and, and talk about uh, how they're approaching the same set of challenges. Do they have the same ground truth, do they see different, do they use information differently, similarly? Yeah, so if, if we talk about the you know, People's Republic of China, uh, in some respects, they very much mimic us in the US, right? And how we have gone about growing our military from carrier strike groups uh, to, to even cyber. As we created US Cyber Command and brought all those capabilities to bear and teamed it up with the National Security Agency, like they did the same thing, the same thing. The advantage that we have, and, and they have tons of advantage, right? They don't have thing, something called the US Constitution, right? They don't have a, a Congress and Senate that, that limit uh, what you can and can't do. You know, I could tell you stories, I won't, but, but they don't have those, that bureaucratic limitation, right? They, they don't, they don't. So there's a lot of freedom of maneuver that they have in order to gain an advantage. But, but I will tell you ultimately, right, this right here, is our advantage, right? The power and imagination of, you know, I mentioned some of those incredible Marines I've been around, but, but what we can do, even with our limitations, even with the requirements of, of executing according to US code and the US Constitution, as you would expect us to do, right? This is our incredible advantage. So certainly disadvantages, uh, but the imagination, the power of innovation, all that stuff really resides in places like Salve Regina, that, that really give this nation, ultimately, our future. This question in the back. Mike's coming to you. Thank you. Good evening, sir. So we always hear about the next generation this, the next generation that. And then you talked about how the Marines of World War II gave us the Pacific we know today and the position that we're in there. How prepared is the Navy and the Marine Corps today, this generation, um, how prepared are they and their personnel to maintain what that old generation gave us? Wow, that's a uh, pretty heavy, heavy question. <laughs> uh, certainly, we're in a, a period of transformation. Uh, are we ready to fight tonight? Absolutely, we are. Absolutely. Well, everything we got, everything we got, we have Marines, 33,000 of them west of the international dateline, right? Ready to fight, gloves come off, let's go. Now, what kind of advantages can we gain as we transform the force to do everything we didn't to do? And, and really, at the end of the day, the art and science of all this is not fighting, right? It's, de it's competing and deterring, right? That's the goal. Got to fight. We're fighting now. Readiness really at a, a, a strong inflection point. Is it enough? You know, I, I'll take our chances. But, but at the end of the day, right, the reason for change, the reason for transformation is never to get there and to deter at, 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 every, at every stop. Question right here. Microphone's coming to you, right behind you. Oh, yeah. um, with everything you presented, how much, lack of a better word, assistance do you get from industry and academia? It's a lot of smart people. You know, they have no, obviously no military background, but they get what you're trying to do. So how... How does the military interface with industry and academia and vice versa? Better. Better. You know, we, 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 as a DOD, we gave up a lot of our innovation arms. You know, a lot of the breakthroughs from a technology standpoint in the past 
big chunk of them came from DOD to, to include the internet. But, but there was a lot of that, the, the past model was certainly DOD centric. That's not the model today. The model is, is industry, is innovation, it's, it's capabilities like the, the Defense Innovation Unit, DIU, if you haven't heard of it, but it's a DOD entity that reports directly to the Secretary in Silicon Valley. So using all the uh, early capital that you can put against a up and coming company that's doing technology that's going to be enhanced, enhancing our mission, like start early and invest there. And so, you know, DOD, slow, bureaucratic, a lot of things you can certainly say, but, but there are, you know, rays of hope and real light and real progress being made on how we use the, the innovation primarily driven from industry, I think the ideas coming from a lot of our young men and women. But, but that partnership is critical. Getting better. Question, microphone's coming to you. This is sort of a follow-up to what this gentleman asked. How does the military keep the people in the military long enough to be as productive as somebody like you are and not have them jump ship uh, and you know, go to someplace else that's going to pay them a whole lot more money? Yeah, no. So every day we're faced that as, as leaders. And I, I'll tell you, I, I, that competition is good. It's like really good, right, that our young men and women they're so well trained and they're so talented and they're so good at what they do, can do so much, right? They can live their dreams any way, shape. So we gotta show up as leaders, certainly parochial from Marine Corps, and carry the day. We gotta somehow tip the scales. I mentioned JTF Aries. Those Marines were wildly successful, very skilled, you know, wow. Over 94% retention rate. It, it, amazing. Putting these young men and women in very empowering positions. Right, that, that create outcomes, that have this incredible sense of accomplishment is, is a winning formula. We, we can't outpay them. You're exactly right, ma'am. Not going to happen. Not going to get there. But, but if, you know, if, if the satisfaction right, of doing something they probably can't do anywhere else, by the way, but, but attaining some personal drive that they need and want, we can provide that, I, I like our odds. But, but it's a real... And so we got to look in the mirror every day. Are we doing our job, right? No complacency from a leadership model because they're all walk, because they can, to your point. So it's on us. And if we don't, if we're not successful in retention and really recruiting for that matter, we just got to look in the mirror to find out where the answers are, where the problems are. Right there, we got two on the side. Um, Coming from uh, Europe, especially from Germany in my case, I would also assume that the cyber command and uh, basically is also a thing that you have to do together with your allies, with the NATO. So it would be interesting how you basically liaise with the NATO partners, especially that basically the uh, whatever Russian and Ukraine situation geographically is closer to you know Western Europe. So how you collaborate on this with your partners in Europe and- uh, Yeah, critical. Uh, I will also tell you hard, right? Critical, but, but hard. And, and, and uh, we, 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 we tend to have some success and then, and then and for other reasons, may, maybe not as much, but is absolutely so important to everything we're doing. And even the ability to share, like all the malware that takes place in this domain, everything we find on our networks, everything of, of importance now, we in the past didn't do this, but we share that completely. Uh, so everything we find, everything we ta detect, we provide that back, right, to, to the world for that matter, to industry, certainly, all the antivirus companies, et cetera, and, and all our partners. We also uh, do, do missions and called hunt forward missions with host nations, with nations that want to partner with us and, you know, begin to understand the adversary activity on, on networks. So trying hard, got to get better. There's no doubt this is critical and got to do it as partnerships. Sir. So we're, I guess we're, we're considered, we're in the information age, but we're probably as just as much in the misinformation and disinformation age. So how, 
how does the military uh, prevent being inundated with misinformation, disinformation, and how much of of the how much of your time, say you collectively, do you does it require for you to sift, uh, sift out misinformation and disinformation? So you know, one of the other hats that I wear, I'm the director of intelligence for the Marine Corps. So understanding, you know, from an intelligence standpoint, what what reality may or may not look like, and then understanding. What, what flies across the cyber domain and, and truly understanding the baselines of each is, is important. Very real problem. What I have found is, and maybe the young people, they, they tend to detect it pretty quickly, what this different disinformation, misinformation looks like. There's a, there's a certain uh, probably trend, a certain eye, a certain sixth sense that's, hey, this is BS, right? And, and we see it more times than not that, that they, the young Marines, probably get this before the old Marines uh, get it. So I think there's a natural proclivity to find it fairly quickly because they, they tend to live in it a, a lot more. Uh, not a scientific answer, maybe not a good enough answer, but it's a real problem. Thus, it's one of our three, right, resiliency. We, we, we got to go there. and We got to fully understand what's it's going to look like and what's it going to look like in crisis contingency and, and perhaps conflict because it will be significant. Thank you. Yeah. You know, so one of the big news items last night was out of New Hampshire. Uh, there was uh, synthetic audio, the deep fake audio of the president's voice telling people to stay home and not vote. Uh, you didn't talk too much about artificial intelligence here, uh, but I wonder what, how does this evolution, revolution, whatever we want to call it in artificial intelligence, mean for the way information is being used and exploited by the U.S. military? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you from our, our defense of critical infrastructure and, and those missions that uh, election security is, is one of the prime missions. So, you know, post-2016, certainly 2018, 2020, U.S. Cybercom really spins up to provide this election security uh, apparatus, right, to prevent those type of things. You know, the, the problem with the cyber domain is challenging, right, and get back to U.S. Constitution and U.S. Code is, right, cyber doesn't necessarily have a home, right? A lot of it lives in our homes, right? It, it lives in our data centers. It lives on U.S. infrastructure, right? DOD, that's not something we do, right, by law. And so it gets a bit challenging. FBI, Homeland Security, there's other entities that deal with that, so these partnerships, again, are, are critical uh, as we have, but it does get complicated. Uh, but but you know things like election security, man, especially if it if it's generated outside this nation, is be surprised how good we can be at detecting that. Inside the nation gets more challenging, I think, for obvious reasons. Folks, Lieutenant General Glavy, thank you so much, sir. Thanks, everybody.